and strength to the Hindu faithful. It cleanses their souls. And a world without souls would not be a world, only a pile of trash. Well, all right then. It's like that with the soul. Two souls reside in my breast, perhaps in every person's breast, even in the breast of every Asian. One notices the Asians' contradictory attitudes toward animals. They are regarded as sacrosanct beings on the one hand, and on the other, they're brutally slaughtered as a source of food. In Japan, for example, men tend to eat special diets to pep up their sexual powers. Here, you will find countless small specialty houses offering extra potency dishes to their male guests. These are often prepared from the extremities cut off from living creatures. After all, only the blood-warm freshness of the natural product can guarantee the aphrodisiac potency-increasing effects. Right here, for example, fresh young bull testicles are added during the preparations. The gentlemen consuming this delicacy have nothing against their being filmed. After all, this culinary boost of masculine properties is an integral part of the social and regular diet among the sons of Nippon. How about some roast member of bull or some sweet and sour prostate gland from calves? Germans have their sausage huts, Italians their pizzerias, and Americans their Kentucky fried chicken. The Japanese have their snake houses. That's right, snake houses. Now, that doesn't mean that these clean reptiles are the main part of the diet for gourmets between Sapporo and Nagasaki. Still, take a look at how this restaurant chef delicately prepares this reptilian dish. You may not think he's being particularly gentle about it, but just think. Your Sunday roast didn't come from a calf which died of old age, or from a cow who laughed herself to death in the slaughterhouse either. different strokes for different folks. We shouldn't make too much fun of the ancient Japanese belief that powders ground from the dried Fujiyama snakes are good for one's potency. This industrious apothecary thinks nothing of making potency pills and a host of other aphrodisiacs out of his slithering pets.
Examples like these can't go far enough in explaining most Asians' different attitudes toward animals. It's something which stems from their irrational relationship to pain, death, and the world to come. The local market in Singapore's Chinatown. Here, people buy all sorts of delicacies for their kitchen pots. It doesn't bother anyone to see beheaded pythons twisting their long last dance of death as they hang on meat hooks, or to see geckos skinned alive. Or to see flying dogs and harmless giant bats pulled out of their cages and torn limb from limb. Customers calmly wait until the sellers are done with their barbaric work. Then they take the twitching corpse home where they throw the so-called vampires in the pot. Nobody winces as they watch the shell being brutally ripped off the back of a turtle. Was this the will of God when he told man to subdue the fowls and the beasts of the field? Does Allah bless such actions? Didn't any of the thinkers and founders of the great religions have any sympathy for God's other creatures? Here, we would like to insert an episode which our camera team came across as it was traveling to a remote village in Malaysia. We were crossing a jungle lake when we spotted two poachers on the trail of a large freshwater turtle. We must be fair enough to state that the Malaysian government forbids this type of hunting. But rules and regulations are only as good as the ability to enforce them. These pictures speak for themselves. How do we express our outrage? Maybe the words of poet and religious philosopher Romain Roland will serve. Man's brutality against animals and his inability to feel empathy with their misery is one of mankind's worst sins. It is the very basis of human degradation. And if man can create so much suffering, what right does he have to complain when he himself suffers? upon most Asians' contradictory relationship to other creatures of the world. But the other side of this study shows that our fellow man in Asia also places much value on the fidelity and trust of his winged and four-legged friends. We find the monkeys of Kwantan over on the idyllic eastern coast of the Mylite Peninsula. They are excellent examples of Asia's duality toward animals. These monkeys are valued as hard-working coconut harvesters. They and their owners migrate from plantation to plantation when the coconuts have to be brought in. The fees for the monkey's labors enables their owner the luxury of not having to work for more than three or four days a week. Long live the monkey's union. They've achieved something the average worker can only dream of, a four-day week. It seems to be a universal necessity that animals have to be used to help man make a living. However, in India, Animals, and especially snakes, enjoy a different form of human exploitation. 
Strangers to India will immediately notice all the fakers charming magnificent cobras out of their baskets for enough bakshish. A reptile bite is deadly. So this dangerous game can produce unique thrills for those standing too close. on the primitive flute are there more to charm the audience into paying than the snake. Cobras are deaf. They only imitate the rhythmic movements of the snake charmer swaying in front of them. Deeper into India, we come across festivals dedicated to the snake, a household deity, protector of families, and symbol of intelligence and power. Farmers drive their reptilian pets through the village on decorated carts. Children offer all sorts of vipers they trap themselves to the highest bidders. Adults bring their health protectors over great distances to temples where the priests can bless them. Families visit each other to watch the snakes dance. What an occasion for small gifts and passing candy. There are even treats for the silky artists. At least snakes aren't eaten as delicacies themselves here. Let's sojourn in India for a while with its traditions and religions where eroticism and sexuality play major roles. Kajarajo, this temple city and its majestic monuments were erected by a generation of Shandala kings about 1,000 years ago. Nowhere is the erotic mysticism of the Hindus better expressed than on the artistic reliefs on these temple walls. Reliefs portraying the bodily union of thousands of divine pairs coupled in the most different positions according to the ancient tantric rituals. Unlike Christianity, Tantra positively uses sexual experience for reaching higher levels of consciousness and wisdom. After all, the great god Krishna himself taught his disciples to enjoy all of life's pleasures so as to get a foretaste of what heaven itself is really like. These reliefs leave the viewer with the feeling that there must be something divine about physical love after all. These scenes may remind some cynics of less meaningful pornographic portrayals dating from our own pre-Christian era. Perhaps they will ask themselves if the seductive god Krishna and Shiva aren't really the cause of a unstoppable population explosion. The road to Banarat, that holy city of the Hindus on the banks of the Ganges River. Those who brave the journey are magically drawn to the ghats, those steps leading down to the river bank into the wondrous currents of the Ganges. Here, even the most hardened of Western cynics can't help but be stunned and shocked by the grinding poverty and human misery. Beggars, leprous women with their starving children, 
cripples, freaks, deformities, and others whose open wounds swarm with flies and maggots. No, these are not impressions out of any horror film. This is but a short span in the daily realities of this eternal river. Siddhis and sadhus, ascetic beggar monks, admired, adored, and worshipped by many Western dreamers and fanatics. There are hundreds of them here in Benares. And although it is possible that they may have a positive influence on some people, and that they may put others on the right path, we seriously doubt that the teachings and experiences of these philosophers are any sort of revelation against the helpless suffering of the masses here. Such thoughts are only prompted by their own failure to stem the misery in their own country. An Indian is born every one and a half seconds. 60,000 new mouths to feed a day. 22 million every year. Subtracting the death rate from this figure gives us an annual population increase of 15 million people each year. And only a fraction of these will ever be adequately fed. Old men meditating about the meaning of this life or preparing themselves for a better fate in the next existence are of little help to the starving. Is death a release from all this misery? Hindus believe it is. And being cremated on the banks of the Ganges and having one's ashes strewn in the river is the best guarantee of a better existence in the next life. Families fulfill the last wishes of their departed ones, bringing their bodies here to be cremated on the banks of the river Ganges. Our camera team was able to film these unique and authentic shots of actual cremations. It is next to impossible for strangers to enter the region of cremation sites, but we did it under extremely difficult conditions and dangers. Wood has become rare and expensive in India, and many relatives of the dead simply cannot afford enough of it for a total cremation. That is why so many only half-burnt or barely singed bodies are given up to the river. wealthy Indians can afford a total cremation. They then entrust the ashes to the priests and wait until the ritual prayers are done with before departing Benares. Wait until the vultures roosting in the palm trees descend to finish off what the flames have not consumed. These ugly giant birds clean up the rest. They mercilessly descend on their prey and gulp down the earthly remains of the recently departed. The flames of the funeral pyres flicker throughout the night. A choking, biting smoke 
stinking of burnt flesh, lies low over the banks of the Ganges. Death reveals to man what he really is. Indians have learned to accept it. It is not evil in their eyes, but merely a seed for another life. This may help us to understand why they think nothing of drinking and bathing in these waters for their own purification, while half-burnt, half-rotten bodies float by. Many of them drink of this filthy, infected water. Yet nobody's health seems to have been hurt by it. It is one of the great miracles of Asia. There is no logical scientific explanation for this. Shocking Asia. Or is Asia merely another world of different attitudes and norms which seem so strange to us because we've been raised in a world of standardized habits and patterns? A traveling sect from Hong Kong celebrates the festival of the monkey god in Singapore's Chinatown. These mediums sink into their ecstatic trances after the ritual songs and prayers to the spirits. The trance is a universal precondition for paranormal activities. ceremonies, chants his formulas and makes his magical preparations, all the while bringing the oil in the iron pot to the boiling point. The celebrants with paranormal abilities reach their states of full possession. That means the spirits they have called have entered them. They step outside. The oil is really boiling by now. The mediums first shove their bare arms into the turbulent hot liquid. Then they pour the steaming fluid over their faces, arms, shoulders, and chests without any apparent scalding. The sect members then re-enter the ceremonial tent where they shake their possessing spirits off and regain normal consciousness. This act is a serious test of the parapsychological qualifications of those Chinese who practice faith healing and dowsing. Europeans tend to regard ecstasy and trance states as symptoms of hysteria caused by religious fanaticism or drug abuse. Other cultures give more importance to hypnotic states induced by autosuggestion, acoustic 